please join me in welcoming Ambassador Burns to the podium. Thank you very much. Good morning. Graham, thanks very much. We just celebrated the 250th anniversary of Robert Burns' birth on January 26th. I did have haggis, I told you that that day, and some scotch. It's a pleasure to be with all of you um, here in Camden at this beautiful opera house on a beautiful morning. Uh, my task is to speak about American foreign policy moving forward. So what is Obama going to face as he looks out in the world after his first 30 days? I'll try to do that briefly because, like General Scowcroft last evening, I thought the question and answer period with him was really just brilliant and interesting. And I thought he was brilliant. I worked for him 20 years ago when he was National Security Advisor. I worked for the first President Bush, as Graham said, in the Soviet Union. And I thought that we heard a lot of wisdom last night from General Scowcroft. I cannot promise you any wisdom from me. He's a singularly unique and experienced and wise person, I think. The only person to have been National Security Advisor twice. And, and, and most people would say he wrote the record of how to be a National Security Advisor. And what struck me about his remarks, I was thinking about it this morning when I was trying to reflect what I should say, was how he emphasized change and transition. Uh, and we do live in an, an incredible period of change, if you think about it. And he intimated this last night. We're, we have been moving from the industrial age to the global age. We don't have, really have a good name for it, the age of globalization. We're trying to move, because we're concerned about climate change, from a carbon-based economy to something different or a carbon reduced, or perhaps even at some point in the future, a carbon free society. We're certainly living in an age when the United States, while still the dominant country on the international scene, has to share that power now, really for the first time in a very long time, the first time since the end of the Second World War, with lots of other countries in the world. And we're living at a time when we're at one of those periods where the international system needs to be reconstructed. And I think that's what Brent was trying to say last night. Most of the institutions that form the backbone and the structure of the international system are old. And they were created for a different world, the world of the immediate post-war period, 1945 to 1949. And if you think about it, we've had about three of these periods of reconstruction, renewal, and change in the last 100 years. We had this opportunity in 1918 and 1919. Four empires had collapsed. And Woodrow Wilson went to Versailles with big ambitions. And if you've read Margaret Macmillan's fantastic book, Paris 1919, she details the opportunity that the world had and how we squandered it, particularly we Americans, when we did not join the League of Nations. And we subsequently saw the rise of the fascist powers and inherited the Second World War. We had a second opportunity. And it went, much, it went much better between 1945 and 1949 because men like, and women, but men like Roosevelt, FDR, and Marshall, who had been younger serving officials in 1919, saw the mistakes that had been made. They had an enemy in front of them. Certainly Marshall and Truman did, the Soviet Union, which concentrated their minds. And they made great decisions and then followed through when they created the United Nations and the IMF and the World Bank, as Brent suggested last night, and NATO, and the coal and steel community that became the common market and then the European Union. And we constructed a peace and then a, a strategy to preserve the peace through containment that held for 45 to 50 years. We made good decisions. And we had the patience and long-term vision that Obama's been talking about that we certainly need. We had it back then. So the question, I think, for this conference, in a way, is what are we Americans going to make of this third opportunity? Because we know that the institutions that we have been relying upon for peace and security are sagging and weakening. And they're no longer up to the challenge of a globalized world in the 21st century. What kind of decisions should we make? And are we going to be smart enough uh, to get these decisions and make them, make them stick? I think that's the challenge for the United States. And I think that's what President Obama was talking about throughout his campaign. And he's been talking about it for the first 30 days of his presidency. Uh, he has an extraordinary amount of weight on his shoulders. If you think about what's happening in our country, and everybody here knows it and feels it with all the problems that we're confronting. So I thought I would, just to get the discussion started, try to say, what's the good news? 
what can we rely on as strengths for our society and country and indeed the world as we look ahead, and what's the bad news? What are the big challenges? It's 8.30 on a Saturday morning. You're all nice enough to come out to this opera house. I'll give you the good news first. I think that President Obama, as Commander-in-Chief and President, can rely on three metrics of power that will be the foundation of America's relationship with the West, rest of the world. And they're very obvious. The first is military. We're still the strongest military in the world. We will remain the strongest military power for as far into the future as we can see. There's no combination of powers that can approach us in terms of military power the ability to deploy that power around the world, the ability to sustain it. What we've done since 9-11 in deploying 33,000 troops to Afghanistan, keeping them there since October of 2001, and now going to add another 17,000, Obama announced this week. We've deployed 150,000 men and women to Iraq and have sustained them there. And I think the story of our time, Iraq, Afghanistan, and before that in the Clinton administration, Bosnia and Kosovo, is that our, our men and women have been absolutely superb on the battlefield. And they've done us proud. And they've protected us as much as they can from the evils that surround us. So we have military power. The next 10 to 15 countries combined don't spend as much on their military defense as we do. And that's a unique asset in a violent age, in a troubling age, where there are dangers out there uh, that we need to protect ourselves from. Second dimension of power is political. When Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State, she said, and she said, we're the indispensable country. And a lot of the Europeans said, um, that sounds arrogant. She said, no, it's not arrogant. We're the indispensable country, because whether countries, peoples like us or not, and there is a fair amount of anti-Americanism in the world, when times are tough, when they have problems, they call on us. So if you think about some of the things that have been happening around the world, problems between China and Taiwan for the last 20 years, the United States at times has been a sort of mediator between those two. For 61 years now, we've been a mediator, not always very successful, in fact, not ever ultimately successful, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, when the Mumbai bomb, uh, bombings, attacks, the terrorist attacks occurred in November, who was the first foreign leader to visit Delhi and Islamabad, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. So countries, whether they like American power or not, whether they respect us, whether they feel pro-American or anti-American, they look to us for political leadership. We are a factor. We are the strongest factor in the political fa fabric of the world. And I think that will remain a source of our power in the future. Third dimension, third bit of good news, is that um, my colleague Joe Nye at Harvard uh, wrote a book called Soft Power. It really does exist as an element in international politics. I know that from my own career in diplomacy. It's the combination of our values, of the attractiveness and strength of our businesses, particularly of our universities and our non-governmental institutions. It's our national story of immigration and acceptance and tolerance that makes us attractive. We're not the only country in the world that has soft power. Most countries have soft power. We have a lot of it. It tends to be universal because we're an international society. And so that's an element of our power. It can be a form of diplomatic power. I would say we need to rely on this more, not rely on it totally, because the world's too violent for that. We can't be naive. But it needs to be seen by us as citizens and certainly by our leaders as an element of our national power. I heard Obama saying that in the campaign trail. I hear him saying that in the first month of his presidency. I'm encouraged by it. That's all the good news I can think of <laughs> on this Saturday morning. Now, here's the bad news. You know, imagine that President Obama called one of you, or all of you, and said, I'd like to see you tomorrow morning in the Roosevelt Room, just off the Oval Office. I've been focused on the stimulus package, on the mortgage bailout, on the bank bailout, on all the other bailouts. I need to turn my attention for a couple of hours Sunday morning, tomorrow morning, to foreign policy, the international landscape, what would you tell him if you had 15 or 20 minutes to talk to President Obama and Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden? What would you say to them? I want you to think about that. Because when it comes to the question and answer, maybe Graham and I will pose the question to you and ask you what you think. Here's what I'd say. I'd say, Mr. President, there is all this good news that I just detailed, but there's a lot of bad news, too. And the first bad news is, I'd say, remember I talked about 
the positive metrics of our power? Well, I'm going to start the bad news with a negative metric of our power. Uh, it's the economy. And it's our economic foundation here at home. And it's our economic prosperity globally. And we're in trouble. And the foundations of our country have been shaking since September 16th, 2008, when the trouble became most apparent. And if I had to choose one metric that is absolutely indispensable for a country's power, it's not the military and political and soft power, it's economic power. Because I don't think we can sustain a fully engaged, active, energetic, and successful foreign and defense policy on behalf of our country if we've got double-digit unemployment and if millions of people are losing their homes, and if there's no hope or even certainty about what's going to happen in the next two or three years, I, it'll affect the psyche of the American people as they look out in the world. And we've already begun to see that. We've seen elements of both isolationism coming back. It's never really left us in our 232 years as a country. We've seen elements of protectionism written into the stimulus package. And you've seen the outcry around the world about that. And so I say to the president, obviously, this is the most important issue. He knows this. Before you and before the American people, it's going to be 90% of your presidency. It's going to define the first 100 days, the first year. It may define whether or not there's a second term for the Obama administration. And I say that as someone who feels very supportive of what President Obama is trying to do. So that is the first bit of bad news. The second is that I can't remember a time as a former diplomat, now someone teaching diplomacy in politics, international politics. I can't remember a time when we've had such a forbidding international agenda in this country. I mean, think of the agenda that o President Obama has inherited. Two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, where there really is no end in sight yet. We don't have an established withdrawal schedule in Iraq. As General Scowcroft said last night, and I respect him in his experience, we shouldn't have one. That's so obvious at this point. We have a war in Afghanistan, which many people believe will become the crucible for President Obama the way Iraq was for President Bush. We're not winning in Afghanistan. And we have to figure out a counterinsurgency strategy that can be successful. Nayan and Chandra and I were talking about the, this on the long drive from Logan to, to Camden yesterday. He'll speak to you later on today how difficult this is to put together a humanitarian assistance, rule of law, program to help the people of the villages of Afghanistan to turn away from the Taliban and to support the government. It's an extraordinarily difficult task for our troops, for our aid workers, and for our diplomats. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Climate change. 2009 will be a defining year. As the Obama administration says, we're going to dive into it. You've got another expert here in Paula Dobriansky, who's been doing a lot of our negotiating. She'll speak to you as well. Uh, and she's a real expert on climate change. Think of um, the threat of pandemics. Think of the fact that the World Bank is forecasting food shortages and a 50% increase in the demand of food in the world by 2025. Think of the fact that terrorism is still with us, that international crime cartels and drug cartels are still with us, that trafficking of women and children is a scourge around the globe. And I've just named what? Seven, eight, nine? issues. I think if we spent two minutes and went around the room, we'd come up with 20 or 25 issues. And so I'd say to President Obama, if I had the chance, if you had the chance, what a daunting foreign policy agenda he faces. That's the second bit of bad news. Here's the third. Other countries are gaining on us. Uh, our unipolar moment that Charles Krauthammer talked about roughly between, say, the fall of the Soviet Union, Christmas Day 91, and maybe 9-11, it's over. We were supremely powerful during that window of time. A lot of us in this room served in the US government during that time. It was a remarkable time, a remarkable time of strength for us and purpose and opportunity. But it's over because China and Brazil and India are becoming global powers. And Mexico and South Africa and Nigeria and Indonesia are certainly regional powers. And they have more ability to influence things in the world. That's going to affect the way Americans see the world, the way we operate in it. It's going to limit some of our possibilities. It may expand others. And the fourth thing I'd say to President Obama is that um, there's something normative, too, that is going to be a problem for you. It's about Americans and how we view the world. Are we going to be able to, are you going to be able to motivate 
the United States, the American people, at this time of great stress at home, to continue to go out and do the things we have to do and spend the money that we're going to have to spend to be successful in the world. And our national history is a little bit checkered. As Brent said last night, we've been a little bit ambivalent as a people. As we look out in the world, it goes all the way back to, to the founding fathers and the debates that they had about whether we should have a central bank and a strong government and compete with the Europeans or whether we should, as Jefferson said, essentially perfect our pure democracy at home. Whether we should go out and expand the country and think of ourselves as an empire or whether we should, as John Quincy Adams famously said, not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. I mean, this argument is all throughout our history. We, Teddy Roosevelt and President Charles Eliot of Harvard debated whether we should be an empire. I think President Eliot lost that debate because we became an imperial power and acquiring the Philippines at the, after the Spanish-American War. Who was the most popular American of the 1930s? I think it was probably Charles A. Lindbergh. What was he doing in the 30s? My dad told me about this. He was going around to Boston Garden and Madison Square Garden saying, that's not our fight in Europe. That's not our fight against the fascist powers. And I think, luckily, we had a president, FDR, who said it, eventually said, it certainly is our fight. When I was State Department spokesman, the um, Senate Foreign Relations Committee decided, Senate decided to cut our dues to the United Nations in half. We have another real expert here on the UN, Kristen Silverberg, who was our Assistant Secretary of State, in charge of UN Affairs, recently ambassador to the EU. And, you know, she and I worked to try to build up U.S. support for the UN. But back in the 90s, our dues were cut in half. And Madeleine Albright said to Senator Jesse Helms, you know, we've got to pay our dues. We're the founding country, we're the host country, and we're the lead donor. And if we don't pay our full 100% dues, what kind of message is that to the rest of the world about our commitment? To what most people around the world say is the supreme international organization, despite all of its troubles and weaknesses, the United Nations. So this fourth bit of bad news is, what choice are we going to make in the 21st century when we face all these problems at home? Will we be willing to go out and be energetic and ambitious and engaged in the world and not try to withdraw from the world as we have so often or as some would have, well, some thought we should, you know, kind of go it alone, be unilaterally. I think both isolation and unilateralism are recipes for failure in our foreign policy. So that's a lot of bad news to give the president on one morning. What do we, how do we think about getting out of the mess that we're in, digging out of the hole that we're in? Well, I just to start, to start the conversation, I'd suggest a couple of things. First, getting back to economics, recognizing that there's been a huge transfer of power from Wall Street to Pennsylvania Avenue. I mean, if you think about it, when the Senate and House passed the first bailout package of what was $750 billion back in October, that just didn't transfer money, it transferred power from the financial institutions in New York to the President, the Secretary of Treasury, and the Congress. And we haven't had so much power now invested in Washington politicians and bureaucrats, I think, since the New Deal. And I'm not uh, opposed to this because I can't see any alternative but for the federal government now to step up and play a big role in the economy as, as President Obama has suggested. But here's the problem. Will we get the balance right? And I'm someone who believes in government, was very proud of my own service in government, ability to serve, and thinks that government can be a positive agent in our society. But can government do the right things to protect us from the financial problems we're in, but also not suffocate the business sector, not take away risk, not take away the ambition that ultimately is going to bring us out of this, at some point, we hope, economic hole that we're in. And I think getting that balance right which is going to be exceedingly difficult for the President and the Secretary of the Treasury and the Speaker of the House, getting that balance right. Regulating, we have to regulate. We probably shouldn't, in hindsight, have dismantled FDR's entire regulatory legacy. That began in the Reagan administration, continued, continued through the Clinton administration, on to the Bush administration. So when we re-regulate, can we do so in such a way that preserves some of the best part of what the private sector is going to need to help us all become prosperous again. I think that's a big historical shift to think about of power, and I hope our government can get it right. Second thing I'd say in a prescriptive sense, what should we do? 
is to recognize that this, there's another big shift that I talked about before, the shift of political power around the world. Now, if you're a zero-sum thinking person, if you think that when China gains, we loses, we lose. <laughs> let, me, let me try that again. When China, when China gains, we lose. So when the Chinese become more powerful militarily, we must become less powerful. If the Indian high-tech sector grows, we have to lose. There are certain people who look at it that way, who think that maybe we're back in the Cold War, when a zero-sum mentality might have been more appropriate and rational. But if you look at it a different way, and I have a suspicion that President Obama, because of his life experience, because of his travels and orientation, does, sees it in the second way. If we see it as glass half full, not glass half empty, then we can see that the rise of these other powers is not necessarily a bad thing for the United States. Think of it this way. There's, there's no global, global governing board of the world, but there's a virtual global governing board of the world. We're on it. Japan's on it. European Union countries are on it. Um, we need to invite China to become a full member, and India and Brazil, at least, and some of the other countries that I talked about. We need to say to them, in addition to your corporate, corporate board seat, there are annual dues. And there are expectations that you'll serve on committees so that your troops will do more of the peacekeeping of the type that our troops have been doing. And it, you'll pay for more of those UN peacekeeping operations in Africa that we have been principally paying for. And that, you know, President Bush gave you a pretty good lead, China, India, Brazil. He put $30 billion into an HIV AIDS long-term program in Haiti and Southern Africa. You should do things like that too. If you think of all the problems that we face, none of them can be resolved by the U.S. acting alone. And none of them can be resolved by the U.S staying at home. So we're going to have to look for partners in countries to help us. And I think if we look positively at the rise of China, India, and Brazil, ask them to be more responsible, more involved. And if we are more collaborative with them, this, not, this trend of power being more diffuse in the world need not be negative for the United States. It need not be something that weakens us. I actually think it can strengthen us. And as General Scowcroft suggested last night, we then need to look at the international institutions and say, don't they need to be reformed? The United Nations Security Council uh, is the Security Council of 1945. It's the world of Chiang Kai-shek, Joseph Stalin, Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, Charles de Gaulle. It's their world, but it's not our world. And a Security Council without India as a full member, without Brazil, as a full member, without Japan, the second largest donor to the UN system on it, without a single African country represented, not a single one, as a permanent member, that kind of Security Council can't be legitimate or credible, in my judgment, in the 21st century. So this can be a positive story for the United States. That's the second prescriptive point I'd make. Third, we have to be global. We're a global superpower. We have to be active in Latin America, Africa, Europe. East Asia. But I guess I'd say if you have to choose, and to govern is to choose, you have to choose, you have to prioritize. There are two regions of the world that are going to write the history of our foreign policy more or less in the next 10 years, and that's the Middle East, and you'll hear from Tamara about the Middle East, and that's South Asia. I mean, that's where the fires are burning. In the last hundred years, they were mainly burning in Europe. That's why we had to be focused on Europe, First World War, Second World War, Cold War, Balkan Wars. But right now, it's the Middle East and South Asia. It's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I agree with General Scowcroft. We need to be an active mediator. It's the challenge that Iran poses to the balance of power in the Middle East, and that's a very serious, profound challenge. It's the Iraq war. Can we end it well? Can we leave but not destabilize the country? And increasingly, it's the problems of South Asia. Nine and I were talking again yesterday no American would have said at the Camden Conference 10 years ago today, South Asia is vital to the United States. It is now. It's vital to the United States. Because we have this war in Afghanistan, Pakistan, which is going to become the real test. It's where the Taliban are. It's where Al Qaeda is. Uh, we have a friend in Pakistan that is a nuclear armed country, a government that does not control a great deal of its own country a government with nuclear weapons, 
and a government hosting some of the most vicious terrorist groups in the world that are pointed at us. And it's the inability of the Pakistani government to get at the Taliban and al-Qaeda that allows those two groups to cross the border and to make life miserable for our forces and the Afghan forces and the European forces there. It's a huge challenge. And maybe the biggest immediate challenge, maybe even bigger and more immediate than the Middle East challenge for the Obama administration. A lot of bad news. One glimmer of positive news in South Asia. We're constructing with India an enormously positive relationship. This was begun by President Clinton. It was continued by President Bush. India will soon be the largest country in the world by population. It's a democracy. It's relatively stable, as stable as a billion-person democracy can possibly be. Uh, we and the Indians share strategic interests in South and East Asia. We are coming together militarily and politically. And as, if anyone here is in business, I assume, assume a lot of you are, the trade and investment growth in this relationship is truly promising one statistic. Uh, one of every seven startups in Silicon Valley is an Indian or an Indian American. So we have bridges that connect us to India that make that a singularly bright story in otherwise a very troubled region. So I'd say, I'd say to the President, South Asia and the Middle East will be and must be your focus. Last thing I'd say is this. It sounds like an Obama campaign slogan. Hope, not fear. And I think the President has internalize this. Uh, we lead at a time when we have to project a positive image of our country and a positive image of our um, intentions and strategic ambitions to the rest of the world. And so if the rest of the world believes that poverty and social justice are important, and the people in the Andes believe that and in Haiti, then we have to stand up for those values. We have to say it. And we have to mean it and help them. If most of the people of the world would say that climate change is the most important pressing issue, and many people say that in Europe, then we have to be in the middle of that debate. And Paula will talk about how we might do that, I'm sure, in the coming months. Uh, I just think our greatest presidents have been those presidents, Democrats and Republicans, that at times of really great challenge didn't project fear, but projected hope and a positive spirit. Woodrow Wilson did for a time in 1917, 18, and 19 until the great disaster of our failure to join the League of Nations. FDR certainly did with his four freedoms. Ronald Reagan did when he said people shouldn't have to live under communist regimes. They should be able to live in freedom. And my sense is, as an American, uh, that Barack Obama has this potential as a leader in the way he addressed the world in his inaugural speech, in the El Arabiya interview, in some of the very positive things that he's done, some of them are symbolic but important for the rest of the world, saying Senator Mitchell's going out on a listening tour, as Brent said last night. Hillary Clinton said she was on a listening tour. A lot of her activities in Indonesia, South Korea, Japan, and China were highly symbolic. I thought highly appropriate, not just to go and meet the leaders, but to go out and reach the people and to project an image of an America that wants to contribute to the global good. I think that's probably the key test for us and for our president. Uh, we're so big and powerful. You know, McDonald's and Starbucks are on every street corner around the world. The US military is everywhere. We're kind of so present that people want to know that this strong global superpower actually is going to contribute to the global good. So if we're the largest carbon emitter with China, we've got to be seen to be contributing a solution to climate change. And if we have been, since 9-11, if we've launched two military invasions of foreign countries, we've now got to be seen to be part of the healing process and rebuilding process of those societies after the wars that we were forced to fight. And I think this is this element of projecting hope and positive strength that is Obama's greatest challenge and greatest opportunity. So those are some thoughts for me uh, as to how we might think about what's going well, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, what are some prescriptive things that we could do to try to maintain the strength of our country, because I do believe that the world needs positive, strong American leadership. I'm not an isolationist. I'm certainly not a unilateralist. But we have to be engaged in the world. And I wish our president and 
the new administration all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.